welcome to the Equestrian Canada uh, National Equine um, Health and Welfare Call, um, February 7th, and I'm Dr. Melanie Barham facilitating today. Um, just a reminder that today will, the call is being recorded and it will be posted online on the Equestrian Canada Health and Welfare uh, page of the Equestrian Canada website. Um, the purpose of this call is to share information nationally that's, uh, that's of interest to horse owners and veterinarians um, and be able to share uh, disease outbreak information as well as any other, um, any other matter of national health and welfare significance. Um, so I'm going to pass it over first to Dr. Keith Murch, who's going to give us an update from the Canadian Animal Health Surveillance System. Thank you, Melanie. The, um the network uh, is going to set up the conference call probably within a month. I'll be sending out a doodle poll to all the ONI members uh, shortly here. And so within a month we'll have a, a national call and update everybody on the activities of the, the equine surveillance network. <laughs> and we've, say, fortunately enough, we have completed four case definitions uh, and for for equine diseases, uh, and uh, the, the uh, these uh, case definitions will be posted on the website in the near future. But we we sent them out to the Canadian Animal Health Surveillance Network, which is uh, a laboratory network, for their comments, and we're hoping to hear back on that, and then we'll finalize it and get it set up. The case definitions group as well under CAS will be meeting uh, with APHIS, which is um, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and so we'll be exchanging information on the, on development of case definitions, what they have and what we have, so we're looking forward to that. And we've also started on five more uh, case definitions. Uh, those will be for influenza, strangles, atomic horse fever, salmonella, and equine viral arteritis. So, uh, that's our next group of equine diseases to be working on. Um, the other thing is uh, we have what's called an equine map. Um, we have the second tier draft completed and the links are attached to the maps on the first and second tiers. And I just got that back from the graphic artist yesterday. And so we'll be reviewing that. And that uh, will be put up on the website as well. And we're looking for comments on the case definitions and the equine map with the larger equine group on CAS, and we'll get comments on at the uh, meeting that's coming up. Um, also, too, we did a, a survey of the CCVOs, and that report should be coming out shortly for discussion as well. The um, also the graphic artist has uh, I did up a list of. Uh, Notify reportable diseases for all the provinces, territories, uh, and also for OIE and CFIA. And when I receive that back from the graphic artist, we'll put that up on the website uh, again for comments or for corrections that are to be made. That's my report, Melanie. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And just to clarify, the the survey that was done of the chief Vet the Council of Chief Veterinary Officers that was about their um, willingness to participate in CAS equine and share information between provinces? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. That is to share their notifiable diseases or when, when they confirm cases that they will um, be willing to share those diseases so that they can be posted on the website. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so thanks very much, Keith. So our next, um, next thing is just an update from the Equestrian Canada Health and Welfare Committee. Um, uh, just so a, a quick oh, question. Yes. Uh, I missed the first minutes of the call, but uh, are we going to see the case definition document for comment on this group? Um, this group is mainly for information. This is the, the health and welfare call, so, you, so those documents would be circulated on the CAS equine group, if I'm correct, Keith? Yes, that's correct. But if okay, you were interested... Uh, I'm on the list of the CAS uh, equine network, and I didn't receive the case definition document. I received it uh, from one of my colleagues on the CASHIN, 
uh, the CASM uh, committee, but I didn't receive it from the equine uh, CAS network. Yeah, you will very shortly. Um, we're okay. waiting for comments from the, the CASM group, and uh, once we receive those back, then we'll be sending it out to all the members of, of CAS. So they can go. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Am I am I correct that the that there's a working group working on that? There are. Yes. Yeah. And uh, say so I think we're pretty well completed um, unless there's some comments from the Kazan group that we may incorporate into them, and then we'll distribute it to all the members, and it'll be up on the website as well for further discussion. Okay. And anybody wishing to see those um, keys, they can access it by visiting kaz.ca and then sign up as a member, and then they yep. would they would have access. That's correct. Or if you want okay. if to see them before, then just send me an email, and I'll certainly forward them to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So an update on the, from the Equestrian Canada Health and Welfare Committee. Um, we've been meeting fairly frequently, um, and are planning a general meeting in April. Um, but we are the key initiatives that we're working on. Um, we have we are moving forward with um, with a multi-pronged approach to um, the biosecurity and emergency action plan. Um, training uh, for for horse owners as well as for veterinarians in Canada. So we have lined up um, trainers for uh, a veterinary webinar that would help veterinarians uh, feel confident in coaching their clients through um, through development of a biosecurity plan, as well as an open webinar for any horse owner in, or event operator in Canada who wish to participate. Um, and they would, the outcome would be that they would come away with a, with a biosecurity plan that's written down. Um, these will be available online as well in perpetuity, so if you miss out on the actual webinar date. We have a tentative date of March 31st and April 1st, um, and those are, we'll announce all of the details as we have them. Um, we're just waiting to confirm our um, to nail down contracts and that type of thing. So they will be um, they will be advertised through Equestrian Canada. Um, other things that you may wish to stay tuned for, we are going to be doing um, a social media a couple of social media contests with regards to biosecurity and emergency action plans. So uh, tune in for those as well as making some generic plans available online for people to develop their own biosecurity plan for their farm or for their event, as well as emergency action plans. And now those are the major, those are the major things that we're working on uh, currently. Um, and that's it for me. So I'll pass it over to Dr. Allison Moore, who's the uh, co-lead for the Ontario Animal Health Network. Hi. So. Um, just as a refresher for the Ontario Animal Health Network, our network uh, consists of four equine vets, uh, practicing vets, so one from the northern part of the province, one from the south southwestern part, one from the thoroughbred racing industry, and one from the standard bred racing industry. We also have an equine internist from the Ontario Vet College, a pathologist from the Animal Health Lab, and myself from OMAFRA, as well as an epidemiologist from OMAFRA. So we have quarterly teleconference calls with our network, and they are preceded by a survey that's been sent out to the equine vets in Ontario. Uh, the survey is very short, asks about a number of diseases or syndromes, and provides opportunity for vets to comment on the diseases and indicate if they were increased, decreased, or the same as usual in their practice based on the same quarter the year prior. Also, uh, when we meet for our conference calls, we discuss lab data obtained from two labs in the province, as well as survey results and uh, the perceptions of the vets on the call. So we just had our fourth quarter call recently and are in the middle of finishing the vet and owner reports. The owner reports are posted on the OAN website, which is uh, oahn.ca, I think. Yep. So during the last quarter of 2017, uh, we had seven West Nile virus encephalitis cases confirmed, and that brought the total for the year to 22. Ten of those horses were euthanized, and uh, there were counties in the province that had cases that hadn't had them reported before, so it was a particularly bad year for West Nile. 
other things that came up on the call starting around the middle of December, some vets in practice as well as at the Ontario Vet College started seeing horses with fevers, some as high as uh, 104 Fahrenheit, some with increased heart rates in the uh, 60 beat per minute mark, increased serum amyloid A, which is a marker of inflammation in the 2 to 3,000 area, and with patchy areas of edema in the colon visible by ultrasound. All testing for any agents came up negative. All horses recovered in a few days with uh, supportive care. So this is the second winter that we've seen these kind of cases crop up. So next year, hopefully, we'll be a bit more proactive in trying to gather some more information, such as uh, risk factors, other things. There was also mention, both on the survey and from our network vets, of cases of equine asthma that uh, were refractory to the typical treatments uh, for equine asthma during the winter time. And so they were very challenging to deal with. We've had the added issue of having the past two years uh, weather-wise has been really hard on our hay, so we have a lot of poor quality hay. And so many, actually many people are moving to uh, eating hay cubes, or have to horses eating hay cubes. Um, we also noticed uh, that there's been a trend in the percentage of fecal egg counts, so checking for parasites, um, fecal egg counts that were greater than 500 eggs per gram using the McMaster method. And this trend has been increasing year over year. So when, when the A counts are over 500, those are the horses we uh, target for uh, deworming treatment. So this trend has been increasing um, since 2015 when we first started collecting the data. So the, the percentage of uh, fecal A counts greater than 500 in 2015 was 9.89% to 14 in 2016 and 16% in 2017. So this is something we'll have to pay closer attention to and emphasize education regarding animalmintic resistance. And we always tend to have a couple of respondents on the survey each quarter that are dealing with strongyle or roundworm resistance on farms. We also had an increase in the number of Lyme disease multiplex assay positive tests in 2017. So we had 35% of the tests were positive compared to 26% in 2016. So this could reflect a change in disease prevalence or an increase, but it could also reflect that vets are more knowledgeable about the disease and are choosing um, the types of cases that they're testing differently. Also, uh, during last year, we completed a five-part podcast series on strangles. Uh, for the horse owner. They are uh, present on the uh, ON Podkeem, Podbean site, which is oahn.podbean.com. Um, you'll also find a number of other podcasts there, including a series on Lassonia that was done uh, the year before. There's also a number of podcasts from the other species networks, which are worth looking at. And this year we're working on developing some more podcasts as well as some vaccination campaigns and infographics. So stay tuned. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you very much, Allison. We'll hold questions until the end because not everybody, uh, because the session is recorded, not everyone is comfortable having their questions um, posted online. Um, but I assume, Allison, are you available for questions afterwards? As sure. Well? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to turn it over to Jackie Reprook, um, who is from the National Farm Animal Care Council. Welcome, Jackie. Great, thank you. Thanks. So this is my first time on the um, uh, Question Canada National Health and, and Welfare Call, so I'm a newbie here. Um, Christy had asked if I could um, basically do an orientation to the National Farm Animal Care Council for this first call. and. We would play it by ear in terms of whether there's um, equine-related uh, information that that um, you know I would follow up on, um, on on future calls. But but for now, just to give you a bit of a of an overview of the National Farm Animal Care Council um, and and direct you to any any other resources uh, where you can can learn more because this will be a real short brief update. Um, so many of this, many of you may already know all of this, but uh, hopefully um, it's a good refresher. So the National Farm Animal Care Council, or, or NFAC, um, we are a very collaborative partnership of very diverse stakeholders, including Equestrian Canada, 
uh, created to share information and work together on farm animal care and welfare issues. And, and over the 13 year, almost 13 year span that NFAC has been in, in existence, uh, I think we've evolved to be uh, a pretty essential organization with, within Canada's animal health, or sorry, animal welfare system. Um, and we certainly have a very uniquely Canadian approach. Um, it's very different from many other approaches on farm animal welfare um, around the world. Uh, we address national animal care issues related to farm, farmed animals, and our primary focus is, is on animals raised for the production of food for people. Um, we certainly do have um, other segments of, of agriculture uh, involved in the National Farm Animal Care Council, but, but for, the, for the most part, uh, our focus is on, the, on uh, food uh, producing animals. Um, we're an organization of process. So we are the ones that build the credible processes that support all these diverse stakeholders uh, to come together and develop solutions to animal care challenges. So, um, you know, the codes of practice are something that we're very well known for, uh, and I often um, remind everyone that you know NFAC does not create the codes per se. We create the process by which all the relevant stakeholders, influencers, those with responsibilities or jurisdiction in, in, uh, in farm animal welfare uh, can come together and determine what the standard of care ought to be. Um, and uh, we do it this way because ultimately our, our goal is to have, uh, of course, progress on farm animal welfare, uh, but also maintain the viability of Canadian animal agriculture. Um, we do three things, so uh, three things fall within our wheelhouse. We uphold um, the um, science-informed approach for the development, update, and maintenance of codes of practice for the care and handling of farm animals, and that's probably what we're most known for. Uh, we also uphold a standard, credible approach for the development of animal care assessment programs, so that uh, process is getting more attention uh, of late. And we also, uh, kind of the cornerstone of what we do, I think, is, is facilitating information and sharing sorry, information sharing and communication on farm animal welfare amongst groups that would not normally come together to talk about these types of topics. So I think we're really uh, bridge builders, relationship builders. Um, it's it, What makes NFAC unique is this partnership between animal agriculture, industry groups, animal welfare advocates, governments, scientists, veterinarians, and, and of course the food industry in general. Uh, and it's those relationships that... Um, among stakeholders that don't normally interact together, together that is, is one of our, our key strengths. Um, following from that, we, we support three core values, and, and everyone who's involved in the National Farm Animal Care Council has to uh, adhere to these three core values. So everyone has to accept the use of farmed animals in agriculture. Um, everyone has to believe that animals should be treated humanely, and everyone needs to support approaches that are scientifically informed. And, and while some of those things may sound like truisms, um, sometimes the devil is in the detail, and, uh, and, and we can have plenty of debate about um, uh, you know, what the science actually says and what, what constitutes humane treatment um, and, uh, and that sort of thing. So, um, uh, and the extent to which uh, it is acceptable to use to use animals. Um, so we we, um, we we use that as kind of our yardstick for for all um, members of NFAC in order for them to to partake and, and join. Um, we are funded uh, for our our core operations are funded through membership fees. And we have two membership categories. We have primary membership, which is generally for national associations, organizations. So that's where Equestrian Canada fits. And then we also have an associate membership for uh, individual companies and provincial groups uh, as well. And that's where we get a lot of our uh, food companies, uh, grocers, retailers, food service companies joining. Um, everything else that we do is pretty much um, done through project-based funding. So uh, all the codes of practice uh, are developed through uh, um, project-based funding. We put in applications for uh, for uh, funding to update codes, and it's through the through the uh, well previously grow or currently growing forward two, uh, and then in the next uh, ag policy framework that'll be through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. So um, that is a critical um, source of re source of funding for us to, um, to 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 update codes of practice. So um, if you're interested in learning more about the National Farm Animal Care Council, of course we have a website. We don't have a lot of social media presence, or well, aside from our website. So if you go to www.nfacc.com, 
ca or dot com. Um, everything is available on our website. Everything from the code process. There are whiteboard videos up there. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, um, and there are videos that will take you quickly through the code process, the um, the uh, the National Farm Animal Care Council, and what we're about. Um, and then uh, there's a, a lot more detailed information around how our different processes work and what the steps uh, are that are involved. So um, that's where you can go for more information, and I certainly will hang around on the call for questions if there are any. Okay, thank you very much, Jackie. Um, okay, so the other person that we have an update from isn't able to be on the call, uh, Dr. Ann Britton from British Columbia, BC Mi Ministry of Agriculture. Um, they provided an update, which I'm going to read out here. Um, from their disease, uh, their equine disease surveillance communication uh, that they have that's available on the British Columbia Ministry of Agriculture website. So they, uh, it is a network that works together and provides, um, and provides updates on diseases that are notifiable to the province. Um, and Dr. Britton wanted me to confirm that this, you know, the information that she provides is from notifiable diseases. So it's not, you know, maybe not, if it's not notifiable in BC, then it isn't going to be reported on these reports. But if you wish to find uh, the, the reports or follow them or, or receive regular updates from them, then please do visit their website, um, and just Google BC Ministry of Ag and Equine Disease Surveillance. Um, so the Animal Health Center was involved in diagnostic workup of two outbreaks of equine influenza from late November to mid-December in the Fraser Valley. Uh, the first outbreak involved acute onset of upper respiratory disease with fever affecting 30% of a large equestrian facility after one horse returned from training at a separate facility. The outbreak mainly affected young unvaccinated horses and equine influenza was detected by a nasal swab of a newly affected horse. The barn underwent, underwent voluntary quarantine and affected horses recovered. Twelve horses in total were affected and all recovered over a course of about five days. Attempts to type the virus were unsuccessful. The second outbreak involved acute onset of coughing, nasal discharge, and fever in horses four to five days after one horse returned from training at another facility. Four out of four horses in the barn were affected. Um, Baquin influenza was isolated from a nasal swab of the most severely affected horse, and this horse was not vaccinated. The barn underwent voluntary quarantine. This virus was identified as H3N8 strain. To our knowledge, these, these two outbreaks were separate events with no linkages. So that's the update from British Columbia. And if there is any, um, if there are any further questions about this matter, feel free to email um, our Equestrian Canada uh, staff person, and they will be happy to forward them on to Dr. Britton. Um, and our staff person is Christy House, and the email is khouse at equestrian.ca. Now I'm going to open the line up for any any questions uh, for any of our speakers. Hello, it's Dr. Bettina Baldstein, British Columbia, Canada. I have a couple of questions if uh, if I may have the attention of the group. Sure, go ahead. So my first one is I'm I'm uh, wondering if uh, Equine Canada is perhaps interested in some low input for you but high impact uh, for the recipients' um, outreach work. And I just re recently returned from Cuba and I'm working with a group there called Cuba's Horses, and uh, Cuba has uh, 950,000 horses, which are the primary means of uh, farm work and transportation. And uh, unlike most countries sort of in the Central American region, they have been completely isolated from the input of any of the NGOs like Equitarians, and because these are all, because of most of the NGOs are uh, US based, or they're just too far away. In Britain, for example, has tried to get in there. Um, they have, they are, uh, the people there are very impoverished and, and also uh, the, the degree of sort of education around farriery and veterinary care is, is limited to poor, particularly in the rural areas. And uh, I was wondering if Equine Canada would be willing to send out in, in one of its memos um, a link to Cuba's Horses website. Um, I, there are a lot of uh, Canadians that travel to Cuba for wintertime travel and, for example, WestJet will take one suitcase for free. Cuba's Horses has a website of items that need to be donated. And just to give you a sense of this, I had one dressage coach of mine do one Facebook post, and within a week I had 250 pounds worth of high-quality items that are desperately needed in Cuba. 
For example, um, I saw things like girths for Western saddles made out of a piece of rope with hose around it, girths made out of seat belts, um, uh, horses whose legs are, are uh, badly damaged because their feet are so long that they're interfering and actually cutting the opposite leg because the feet are so long and so out of balance. Anyways, we took down uh, one suitcase full of, of uh, splint boots, bridles, pads, ha- covers for harnesses. The horses there tend to get very thin, and as the harnesses, uh, as they get thinner, they get more and more severe harness sores, and there's simply no materials to pad any of that. So it's something that Canadians can, we can do very easily. Everybody has a tack room full of stuff that they don't use. I was wondering if Equine Canada might be willing to uh, help me out with a little bit of outreach. Uh, It's Melanie Barham speaking. I can't speak for the whole organization, but I'm certainly happy to take that back to our welfare committee and and do whatever we can to to move that forward. All right. Um, Could I send you an email with with, uh, kind of just a brief synopsis? Yeah, perfect. Um, And would you mind, or I can get your email address off the website? Uh, do you want to just stay on the line at the end of the call, and then I can give sure. it to you? Okay, cool. Okay, absolutely. Um, so that, uh, sorry. And Bettina, I... if, there's, if there's other people who wanted to, who are perhaps on the call, who wish to donate now before, you know, it, regardless of whether Equestrian Canada gets involved, how could they do that? Um, uh, by uh, accessing Cuba's Horses which is, if you Google Cuba's horses, it will come up. Actually, the uh, BC Horse Council is really interested as well, so I'm gonna, uh, they, they've, they've sort of offered to help. We're just getting Cuba's uh, horses' website kind of up-to-date based on some information I was able to bring back for them in terms of other things they needed. But we'd love to try to get this done ASAP because, of course, the traveling season is now yeah. uh, for, for most Canadians. And, you know, the, the, the place, of course, is tons of people from Ontario. So, so obviously, uh, the BC connection is good, but Ontario uh, has probably has 10 times as many travelers. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'll yeah, get on that right away. Yeah, that's All right. great. Maybe Ontario Equestrian would also be, um, be interested. Absolutely. Well, we'll share the word. And then I have one other question, but I want to make sure that I'm not uh, um, commandeering too much time. I think it's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Second second question is, is I'm curious as to what Equine uh, Canada's position is or, or is going to be regarding restrictive nose bands in competition. I sent you a letter in uh, uh, February the 6th, ironically enough, one year ago, uh, 2017, to Jorg Bernhardt um, regarding regarding this this what I and many many others see as a serious welfare welfare problem, and that is specifically over tightened nose bands in dressage competition. Um, Jackie Wetbrook would appreciate this. There is um, uh, actually a reference in the code of practice that quote equipment in use must be maintained in good repair and must fit the horse correctly. And I, I humbly suggest that any nose band that has to be tightened with a pair of pliers doesn't fit the horse correctly. And there is actually some pretty decent articles now, scientific articles written about this practice. And uh, I never actually received a response from my, from my letter, and I was really disappointed because Equine Canada did host um, Andrew McLean from the Society of uh, Equitation Science last year at your AGM, which I was mm-hmm. thrilled to see. And had me, you know, science-based horse training, and I kind of got excited. I thought maybe this is the time to do something about nose bands, and I'm curious if you've had any discussion about that. Um, yes. So actually, Bettina, we have had. Um, so our president brought that. For, brought. We. I never. Interestingly, I did not see that letter. So I will follow up. And, and as the. And I've been the chair for over a year. So. I don't think. I, so I'm not sure what happened with that. But I'm happy to follow up. And I apologize okay. if you didn't get a response. Um, we have been discussing this matter on the Health and Welfare Committee, and so I think we will be, I think we, you know, will be coming to some decision in the next, uh, before show season is what we, what we have decided as a committee. Melanie? Excellent. Yes. Can I just, uh, just make a comment here? Um, Equestrian Canada has followed the FEI rules in dressage, and um, nose bends must allow one index finger to be easily inserted for dressage horses. And, and those horses should be checked at the end of each ride or if during a ride it appears that there's an issue. And that, that's in our EC rules. 
for dressage horses. It's it's going past the dressage horses that I think uh, we also need to look at and maybe having a consistent <coughs> measure uh, since everyone's index finger is a little different. And the equitation science group, uh, Paul McGreevely, they have actually developed a gauge yes. for exactly that problem. Yeah, and, and and you know the the you know probably FEI competitions are less of a problem than perhaps you know the more grassroots or provincial shows. But but that's an EC rule, not an yeah, FEI rule. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, is Bettina, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And, and if I get okay. your email, I'd be happy to forward, a, I could forward this letter as well. I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, okay, are there other questions or comments? Uh, this is Wayne Burwash. Keith, uh, is there a movement to have all the provinces uh, have the same reportable diseases? I, I know initially there was a problem with uh, different provinces having different requirements. So would that uh, make uh, matters of defining diseases and uh, reporting uh, a lot simpler? Where, where are we at with that? Yes, I mean, that would be the ideal scenario. Uh, quite a number of provinces do not have uh, reportable or notifiable equine diseases. Um, at this time. So that would be ideal. I think that would be a, a major challenge to accomplish, but yes, it would be ideal. Uh, and if I may add, uh, I'm Claudia Gagnier-Fartin from Quebec. I'm the coordinator of our RESO, which includes the our equine network. Uh, at the moment, our network equine network coordinator is out of the office for uh, an undefined moment, but um, I'm sure that if uh, she had made uh, uh, aware of uh, the, the, the report reporting occasion here today at the conference call, uh, she would have participated. I, I didn't know, so sorry, I cannot do it uh, today. But uh, of course, for reporting uh, on the, the conference call, what we discuss on our um, quarterly uh, conference call, uh, I, I, it is feasible. Um, and uh, for information, our RESO in Quebec is organized the same way as the OAHN Equine Network. So we have uh, practitioners and specialists from our Faculty of Veterinary Medicine on our group. Uh, we had conference call and look at uh, data and uh, uh, results from our laboratories on equine uh, samples or necropsies. So and th we discuss about that and ad other issues uh, regarding animal health uh, in the equine sector every uh, three months. So, and we do a report, but our, maybe our, our um, communication activities are less developed than what they have in Ontario because we don't have any uh, producer report at the moment. Uh, we are looking for that, but we are some issues with the uh, website and uh, at the government level, so uh, for the development of new website, but, but we are looking for some opportunity to, to put that kind of information on uh, the web. But uh, that's it for the moment. So, uh, so yes, I, I think it's visible, and we'll continue to participate. But uh, sorry for today, uh, I was not aware, uh, and I don't have any information there on just uh, to, to 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 tell you uh, now. <laughs> okay, thank you, Claudia. Um, any further comments or questions? Okay, great. And Claudia, would you be, um, yeah, maybe we can chat offline as well, but if, if Rezo is interested in providing a regular update, we'd appreciate that. Yes, I think yes, we could. Great. Oh, wonderful. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, if there's, um, are there any other further questions or comments before we close the line? This is Bill DeBar, <coughs> Horse oh. Welfare Alliance of Canada. Hi, Bill. I'm uh, impressed at the depth of the reports and, and uh, 
conversations here today, and I hope this continues to be a pattern and improves, and uh, we learn how to share some experiences and concerns. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate that comment. Okay, anything else? Uh, anyone else? Okay, thank you.